Jim, Jim, tell us, tell us what brought you to um, who, wanting to speak to us. I, uh, I'm a theatre director, stage director based in the UK, um, doing a master's in opera directing and I'm always YouTubing and Googling the different things on stage directing and opera directing, sort of the theory behind opera performance. There's it's this kind of a, a wasteland. There's not much out there. So I was kind of mining YouTube for that stuff and came across your video and really liked the, uh, the uh, perspective. And I found it really interesting. And also how it links with public speaking, just your practice and also to acting. I found that really interesting. And it made me think a lot. I mean, particularly because what's different, I think, from theatre, well, not different from theatre, often in opera is that often performers won't have had any experience performing. So even, so it all, sometimes can feel like you're even teaching them just to even get confidence to express. Uh, but it's just a different perspective to the stuff I'll be doing on the MA. And it's, I'm just interested in, it just seems like quite a unique perspective that I, I was not very familiar with. And so I just thought, you know, I just thought it was really um, a really interesting approach and take, you know. Yeah, no, that's interesting. So how is it different from what you're learning? Can you, can you pinpoint that at all? So this one book by, I think it's by Mike Alfreds called Different Every Night. I mean, that's a book that we really use in, in Britain. It's all quite, sort of, yeah, uh, a lot of Stanislavski. I mean, I think, you, you know, you're probably familiar with that territory as well. I can see some of that. But in a sense that I think that it's a lot of what's called um, like actioning that you're probably familiar with, like, uh, uh, you know, what am I doing to the other character, um, you know, and it's usually sort of ver verb work. Mm -hmm. And from my experience, I think that can work for some performers really well, but for other performers, it doesn't work as well. I think that in... <laughs> What I wonder about a lot of the, the, the training that I'll be learning is that whether this is great for singers who already have a bit of experience with that, but for ones who don't, it might not be as as useful. Um, you know, when you when you divide an aria into A, B, C, D into the different parts, I mean, and I think that is something that, you know, we do do in, in opera as well, but it's often not necessarily that specific. It's often just, you know, how's the character feeling? And um, I just, yeah, I thought, I thought that was, I thought that was a really interesting um, um, approach. Well, basically I would say, Jim, what we're doing is every time you open your mouth and you're saying something that has been written or that has been memorized, this is no longer, you're no longer a spontaneous speaker. So Jim, you just spoke spontaneously. You were full of energy and qualities and levels and colors. It was fantastic, right? <laughs> it's fantastic. And then you get a performer up on stage and you don't get that anymore. So that's where we're coming from. We want to go back. We will compliment Stanislavski or, or any of the, uh, any of the, Uta Hagen, any of the techniques, we will complement them. What we have done is we're trying to bring some concrete craft to what people are doing. Singers are the biggest problem for the, for in the non-spontaneous speaking world, as far as I'm concerned. I don't know how you feel, Elisa, but they're even worse in some ways than public speakers because they actually have the chore, the very technical chore of singing. And they say to themselves, this is enough. I have this Teflon voice. I have all my high notes. I'm loud. That's enough. But it's not enough. I, I, I would add that they do know they have to do more than that. But what they do isn't nearly enough. On top of the voice, they know that they have to, what would you say, uh, Jim, they, they, they understand the scene and they have a little sense of the character, but they tend to be general. Yes. In all any ideas of character and acting, even, even intention. Yeah, and, and I think I, I like that what you're saying about spontaneity. Well, I think you were kind of referring to spontaneity as well, because I think that um, there's something about that system that you're doing in the, in the video where I think it can also allow them to 
even though obviously there's a set tempo and there's set specific melodies they've got to sing, uh, by working out what the different ways are to say those sections, they can also respond to what they've received. Like I loved it when you were looking at listening, how you also they've got also got to be actively listening exactly. as well. Exactly. But you know they can have different. Also, I think I think what opera audiences want is changing. I think that I think that for order kind of for opera, sorry, to survive, I think that you do need more um, good sort of naturalistic acting. There is a lot of the, I mean, and that can be a stylistic thing. I mean, you can have a more representational symbolic way. Like I'm thinking of the director, Robert Wilson, you know, he did Einstein on the beach and his shows are really kind of modern art and it's all very, you know, and, and that can work. But I think within the age of Netflix and all this sort of thing, I think people want, um, to actually be told stories, you know, they don't just want the baroque gesture. I'm going to do it, you know. Um, well, once I, once you want once you understand the various behaviors, because again, the Vox method is based in is rooted in behavior, human behavior. You can mm. stylize the behaviors. The other problem with the behavior with the stylized approaches is they're not basing it on the full scope of human behaviors. That's the problem. So it could be much richer. What Wilson and uh, Robert Lepage and what these people are doing yeah. is is they are compensating. They are compensating for weak, weak performances from the actors by putting on spectacles. And so it's moving in the wrong direction. I hope your generation, Jim, are going to bring it back to the actual humans and back mm. to the story and not to the giant Trojan horse being dragged across the stage and these little tiny things we see underneath it that are singing their little hearts out, you know? It's mm. so misguided. It's so misguided. The Even uh, the, the brilliance of the setting and the production, that's exciting for just so long. And even the brilliance of a voice, that's thrilling but just for so long if you're not mm. able to bring these characters to life and the story to life so that mm. you're connecting with us you are telling us you are transporting us those other things will never do that not on the level the visceral level that is the only quality we're looking for as an mm. audience I really, I really like that, and I really like what you said about, uh, well, just about your practice coming from behaviour, and I mean, I think the psychology and the behavioural sciences could be something really useful oh, yeah. oh, for yeah. me to learn in particular. I mean, I'm thinking, and, and I know some great directors in Britain, you know, who is, who sort of do that kind of thing as well. But, um, but I mean, it's interesting because even like where your eyes move, you know, yes. like if, if I, if someone asks you, you know, a difficult question, and your eyes kind of go to the side, these different patterns um, of, that we do. And also, because um, I think it's not enough to just work out, I mean, this is important, work out the history of the, of the of, you know, the environment, the place, all the dramaturgy and have it all in your head. If it's not then externalized, I think actors can do that actually, because they've had a lot of three years of training, often physical training. I think some actors are good at just taking all the information in and then kind of, Sort of leaving it alone and it just kind of comes out in their physicality but i think when you're bound to a rhythm and a method and a tempo and all that sort of thing that, that singers are you have to find a way of yeah externalizing it through body language but it has to be blocked and it has to it has, you have to know that you're doing it yeah I, 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 I think yeah well it's not, and that's that's a really good point because even actors are very guilty of of all this thinking about character and stuff and they're not translating that into emotional impulsive energy which is the cornerstone of the basis of everything that we do and speak and feel and if you don't translate that into an energy and it's really not that difficult to do and you don't need years of experience as an actor to learn how to do that i've done that with total beginners within within minutes and you translate because that's how i am right now i'm responding to my thinking oh i've got to explain this oh i'm excited because this is my passion and that translates into an impulsive energy which then comes across through words and through my body or just by me sitting listening to you going oh yeah and that's what we need to learn about our singers our actors or speakers 
I think the singers just need, because singers are hardworking individuals. They've trained, they're disciplined. They're not being given. They're not ge- being given this training. That's what kills me because mm. I actually I actually went through opera school. You know, the, right. you're not being given this training. I mean, I had directors would tell me, well, you've been standing there for a while. Why don't you go over and stand there for a while? And I would, something inside me, I guess that's, that was the birth of the Vox method, right? I mean, something inside me rebelled. I didn't realize it at the time, but I said, but I said, why? Why would I move over there? I have no, I have no impulse to move over there. So th- then it started. That's how it all starts. And this is how I can see it. I can see the wheels going around in your head, Jim. And I know, I know that you're dissatisfied and you know, there's something more there. And that's mm. how it all starts. I don't know where it's going to take you, but good for you. Good for you. You're you're reaching out and you're bypassing the convention and you're looking for you're looking for those missing pieces. Well, I'm telling you that missing piece, and as Elisa says, is not that complicated. It just needs to be explained in concrete, mm-hmm. clear terms to every actor that comes to you. You're going to sit them down, you're going to say to them, listen, I'm looking to find out whether you can actually be a conscious human being and come up with a feeling and an impulse for singing this next phrase. And then for proceeding onto the one after that and for proceeding onto the one after that and the one after that, with each one doing something to your body, to your arms, to your heart, to your soul. And to your vocal cords, right? Because then here's the great thing. It's not only, oh, now they will be better actors. They will be better singers. Absolutely. Absolutely. I I completely agree with that because often I find, you know, singers will say um, it's about the singing first and then the acting. And it's like, how can you not think that they're inextricably linked? Yeah. You know, So where does that that point, where does that phrase of singing come from? Where does that Mm. to come from somewhere not because just- they're not getting they're not going to get the range again of spontaneous tones they're going to get the one tone that they're imposing the tone that's pretty the tone that's beautiful the tone that's loud that's what they're going to get they're not going to get those tones singing can sometimes be ugly and should be it should growl and scratch mm. and grind because that's how you're fucking feeling okay and here's the thing, here's the thing. That's what those amazing world-class artists are doing. Mm. And it doesn't have to be a secret anymore. They might not be so happy about it, but everybody can learn how to do it. But right now it's only those with the gift of the instinct, the actor's instinct, mm. are able to get those unique tones. It's not many. I mean, it's, it's not one or two, but it's not the majority by far. And mm. everyone can learn how to do it. I think there's something about the journey as well. Like I remember when, you know, when I was doing acting and, uh, and you had a monologue, it's like, well, you know, because the monologue is separate from the, um, or like a concert performance when, you, when you're singing something, and because the monologue is separate from, you know, the rest of the play, you have to I see it as a mini play. You have to have a journey and a start, middle and an end. And I just think in a lot of arias and duets and things like this, again, they need to sort of see it what I, what I kept thinking when I was watching your video is exactly where where's the journey that's happening there. It's not just a angry aria or a happy aria. You know, it's all those little bits uh, because uh, and then the more you have into the mix, the more play and intuition the singer has available to them when they know what their options are. They've got more more ammunition to explore as well, mm-hmm. and they have a safety net as well. Absolutely, it, it gives the consistency. You don't have to go all on a wing and a prayer. You understand, you've prepared it. And how do you do that? The journey is specific. It's one thought at a time. You follow the writing and that leads you to this journey. You know, you don't have to impose so much. You have to uncover what's already there. And it's so rich, even in simple texts. Right away, right away. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you this one, Jim. I'm going to give you this one. There's, there's, two key types of movement on stage. One is based, as you say, on the set. The set design is always done. And basically the director works, the actors don't know where the set is and it has to all be taped out, et cetera, and so forth, which is, as far as I'm concerned, a godsend. Yeah. Because otherwise you'd have actors wandering all over the place. 
because they're all they're all loose and free free spirits right at least when you know there's a door there as a director you can say there's a door there you idiot you cannot wander through the wall next to it, <laughs> right so that gives us one escape but the one that's going to be tricky is the other type of movement which i call implicit movement and the vox method is called implicit movement and that's really interesting for that one that refers to the natural behavioral movement do you look at the other character do you approach the other character is it pursuit or flight it, it's all based on psychology and the character and the, and the type of character that your your character is according to the script that determines where you're moving whether you're going forward all the implicit movement is all based on what we call direct and diffuse thinking a reflection versus versus outward aggression all these different types of personalities implicit movement so think of that now to get an actor to work with that you have got to get that nailed down at the beginning and say listen i i work with something called implicit movement which is behavioral movement are you on board you've got to as a director going forward you've got to get your cast on board and literally cast according to the ideal thing, of course, is to have your own company, but literally cast according to the people that are going to go along and be willing to go down this road. Because if you can't go through a rehearsal having a, well, I don't feel like I really want to move now, or I don't want to look over there now. And you're saying, well, the problem is that the script is telling you that you have to. And there, there are some absolutes in well-written scripts. So there are some absolutes there that you as a director have to get the actors to to convey and to portray you have to it's this it's not a free-for-all there's another artist at work here there's the singer yeah. the artist the director artist and honoring the composer compo the composer and i would add that that implicit movement will feel very unnatural to actors who are not used to receiving impulse and having it register in their body the way it is with the three of us just speaking spontaneously. So they're used to this kind of rigidity. And the same thing shows up in musical theater as well, this idea that I'm just gonna plant and sing. And, and But once they start observing that, oh my God, it just opens up such a world of mm. dis differentiation from thought to thought and the liberation. You don't build up tension when you're just holding a position and kind of singing in the same vein for several thoughts. And last of all, if you teach uh, the singers to move well, you'll also teach them to always be balanced. I have watched singers, opera singers on stage do like the creep and they literally end up on one leg and the other one's kind of half there and they're just not even settled. Now the voice cannot operate well within mm. those kind of... Um, yeah, and look at them on the profile. They often look like ski mm. jumpers. You know, the ski jumpers, uh, the Olympic ski jumper flying <laughs> through the air. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I, I do, I'm quite theoretical, but I'd like to learn more about um, the, the embodied aspects and the physical aspects mm -hmm. of things. Because I'm very much kind of here up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you're very academic and educated, but oh, but you're also trained as an actor too. So that's a cool. great Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but just, you were you were talking about you're more a practitioner than a performer. But basically, mm -hmm. uh, as as a director, you have to envision the type of yes. performance you want. So so at yes. this point, you will be both the director and you'll be using yourself and your your own your own sure. uh, your body, your voice, your, your okay. arms, your your whatever to to okay. experiment to experiment uh, to experiment as you would want your cast to sure. to understand what you're saying the um, embodied learning as it were sort of it's thing. an it's a very very practical embodied learning and i think okay. it's, it's it's good because we work with uh, professional speakers singers actors mm. we cover the whole gamut i think you will understand that there's a common thread there so you don't necessarily have to be a performer or a singer to understand what you're supposed to be doing as a communicator, as, as an expressor, as an artist, and, and to emulate that. And it'll, it'll, it'll influence all aspects of your life. Because as a director, you've got to be able to express yourself and communicate incredibly. That's true. Clearly actually, and yeah. succinctly, right? So you will, find, you will find your body language and the way you stand before your cast and the way you present your stuff, that all is going to come into play. 
it would be great to, to learn methods of yeah of how to communicate. I didn't actually have that in mind, but I think that I think that might be really one of the big reasons why I've you know why the, the universe has brought me to you guys. <laughs> um, you know, because it, it it's all well and good to have everything written down in, in the head, and especially when you know I've got this these theories all planned out and and the rehearsal plan, and I'm trying to, you know, it'd be nice to just sort of to have that calm confidence to Mm. be able to communicate in a more um yeah a thought out way which is going to make me more clear-headed which is going to make the environment better for the performance as well um and I think that's something that comes with experience but if I can learn to do that hey. not, get that confidence now then that would be you know why wait? Why wait my whole point is to fill in the missing the missing stuff and and to to formulate it in a way that can be bridge can bridge in many directions i think the vox method can bridge off in many many directions which is what i like about it how did you develop the vox method well as, as i say similarly to what you're going through you are you you wake up in the morning and you say I, I need to discover something. I, there's there's something. There are these dark patches in my in my vision that I I'm not happy with, and it, it starts in a weird way because basically at first you feel very rather inadequate. I felt rather inadequate. I felt rather untalented. I felt that I could not go the route that others are going, and I just felt that I was maybe in the wrong business. But all, but at the same time, there's a there's an inner fight that we have, or, and an inner uh, an inner striving that takes you to this this other place, which is finding out for yourself, discovering for yourself. So everything in the Vox method has been is is uh, a protest is probably too much of uh, too big a word, but it's it's a solution, it's a it's a problem solved. That, that, that gives concrete terminology. And, and the fact is, and that's the most incredible thing about Vox that always surprises me is that when you understand these principles and this, this technical, the technical demands, true creativity comes out. And it's shocking because it's like it comes out of nowhere. We're tapping in through this, the confines of technique, we tap into the instincts and the actors who are open to it, the singer actors are open to it, they will suddenly realize their art at a new level and people will see it on them as well and will encourage them. It's a buy-in, it's a buy-in process. Yeah. They buy in, that's where you get your authority. You can't, you can't be a dictator but you must have the authority. They must see that there's a vision there and that they're willing to follow this vision. That is the job of, of the artist, to follow the director's vision and the composer's vision, the director interpreting the composer's vision. You know, because I think, I think I do want to work with the spirit of collaboration, but I think there is a sense that you know, that authority is, is justified. You know, there's a reason why the designer is doing the set design and, and has the you know, last say exactly, on aspects exactly. of that. There's a reason exactly. why the movie, yeah, exactly, yeah. When you're the one with the masters in directing. That, that's that gotta be sure. worth, that's gotta be worth something. I, I think the best productions, I think you can see that the director is focusing on the music and the conductor is focusing on the dramatic elements. And the, the, there's this, it's it's of a piece, you know, they're kind of, the there's unity 